look at or is doing anything. Mina doesn't want to look at him. Yeah, I mean, all of them are just kind of boring. And the writing is the worst culprit here because I don't even understand the full story of Quartermain and his son. I'm like, oh, it's a trope. He lost his son. So we're just going to play on that trope. And Tom Sawyer is going to become the surrogate son. Is there more to it that I miss? That's how I took it. I wish that I had had more knowledge, more dialogue, more something to let me know Quartermain was all torn up about his son. He says he doesn't want to adventure because he lost people. And his son is certainly in that. But... I don't get that he's so torn up about it that having Tom Sawyer around is going to bring that back when he starts teaching him how to shoot and things. They try to make a relationship there. I don't think Connery's giving it either. I don't think Connery is bringing his best work. Perhaps I'm tainted by the the behind-the-scenes knowledge of things going on here. No, he's not that great. And I think part of the problem is when we meet Quartermain back in... Africa, like he's just fooling journalists with doppelgangers. Like in the comic, he is in an opium den, like drugged up. Like, yeah, Connery said he wasn't doing that. Okay, you need something like that to see how rot he is over his son dying. Like, him just hanging out in a bar in Africa doesn't do it. I still think he's fun to watch. I mean, I'm not saying it's one of his best, but he's better than he was in Medicine Man or Meteor. Or, I mean, I've seen Sean Connery give some shit performances, and this is by far a much better one. I, I think he's trying, but it's not his best. I think he's delivering his lines well. I don't think he's playing well off his co stars, is where I'm going to faint him. I agree. I agree with that. And I think part of it is that his co-stars aren't a particularly attractive brood. And I don't think that the writing makes any sense. But OK, I'm throwing that out because I'm really trying to like this movie as just a visual spectacle. I'm trying to think of this as, all right, what if this is just a gaslight superhero, Justice League, that we're basically just watching superheroes? Maybe they don't serve Jules Verne. Maybe they don't serve Twain. But can they just work as superheroes in 1899? That's what I'm judging this movie on. But yes, now that they're heading to Paris to get (laughs) Mr. Hyde. Now, I I read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde when I was in like middle school or thereabouts. Me too. I loved that book. This is not Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hyde could walk the London streets and... And be mistaken for a human and then go rape some women. This is the Incredible Hulk. I mean, this is taken from the comic. This is how Moore plays him as this big monstrous being. But is this a practical costume? Like It is indeed, yes. It is part puppet. Here's what they said. The Hulk was coming out the same year as this. Ang Lee's Hulk. And they had like 200 million for CGI for Hulk and they had like 10 million here. So they're like, if we're going up against that, let's not even try it. Let's just make a suit. It's not much worse than Thing League's Hulk, but, you know, that one had some dicey effects as well. No, I, I like this as a practical suit. Like later on when we get super hide. That's a different story, but for a practical effect, it's pretty good. I think there's some obvious CGI matting going on yeah, yes. because there's they're still filming this with film, so you can see the difference. So when Hyde is with them and supposed to be giant, I can tell he's not really there, but there's a guy in a suit for almost all the scenes. At the end fight, they do have CGI Hyde going up against another CGI Hyde, but it looks good. It moves well. I thought it was CGI is the best compliment I can give it. (laughs) Again, for me, it's shot by shot. Some shots are better than others. And sometimes I'm with it and sometimes I'm not. Overall, I guess what I'm really wondering by this point is why is everything being shot at or blown up? Why can't we have scenes where characters are talking to each other and convincing us through dialogue? I guess because they don't have it in the script. But yeah, we just jumped to Paris. It's in the middle of a chase scene. We don't even really know what is happening. And they're shooting at him. They shoot him until he runs into a snare. And then that's it. We're off to the adventure. And then the movie does slow down. But for this first 30, 40 minutes, it's just a series of explosions. It's 40 minutes to get the team together. And despite being full of explosions, I'm finding it very laborious and dull. I'm hoping that once they get Hyde on board, that they can now have an adventure. We got through the getting together. Okay, let's do something interesting. Although I got to say, of all the actors, I do think... Jason Fleming as Jekyll and Hyde 
gives the second strongest performance in the film. He may not be as fun as Skinner, the Invisible Man, but... He has conflict. I, I mean, yeah, I, because yeah. he's two personalities, and I, I buy his conflict. He plays both well, and the scene where he's like... He's Jekyll and Hyde is appearing in reflections and trying to torment him into drinking the serum. He plays both those roles so well that I buy that scene. The problem is he's not allowed to interact with anyone. His very nature is to be solitary. And when he's Hyde, he's basically just running around punching things. And when he's Jekyll, he keeps to himself and is kind of creepy pervy yeah so. he doesn't keep to himself that was so weird there's a scene on the nautilus where he's like spying on dorian and nina watching them like kind of have this romantic moment and he's got this pervy smile on his face i didn't i don't know is that from the book is he a pervert is he a peeping tom well what they say here there's some line about him maybe not even needing the potion to talk to hyde the sense is that Hyde is going to overtake him and that he doesn't even really need to drink the potion to channel it. That's almost like a crutch or something. That's what gives him the physical transformation. But Hyde is always there in his reflection, is always baiting and taunting him. I do like that as a conflict. I think the performance is okay. Yeah, it's good enough. But why do they need him? And again, what are these people going to do when they get to Venice? How are they going to protect world leaders who are trying to stop the Phantom from baiting them i guess the problem is there's no sense about what these characters can do together to help the problem at hand i'll give the movie a mulligan in that they were never intended to help anyone anyway but the characters should at least have a plausible belief themselves that they can do something yes. even if the entire point is for them to not and just to get them together to steal their powers which I don't think you need them all in the same place to do, by the way. No, that that's a dumb plan. It, it seems weird. Okay, I get it. You want Captain Nemo because he has a sub. I don't know how you steer that thing around the canals of Venice, but he can you get don't. underwater. Fine. Quartermain, he's an adventurer. Fine. Why do you need anyone else? What did they steal from him? Anything? They needed him because he was the only one who would be able to capture Hyde. That is Quartermain's only purpose. Ah, uh, okay. But but I'm talking about them as a team, saving everyone in Venice. I, I get why you want Nemo. I get why you want Quartermain. I don't know why you need anyone else. If you're just looking for bombs underneath the city, go in your submarine. But they didn't know necessarily what they were looking for at first. And when they get there, it's already started. And so they have to blow up a building. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is where it all falls apart. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Literally, I I am holding on, trying to say I'm having a good time up to this point. When we get to Venice, f*** it. This movie is over. And I'm not having a good time up to this point, but my hope was once they get together, then this movie would click. And it's when they get to Venice, and I, I watched this movie two and a half times for this review. Explain this. It, it was only on the third time watching the scene that I really understood what the hell was going on, okay. why they were driving the car. Yes. I understood that Nemo had trackers and missiles on that sub, and so he could fire wherever the car went. And I got that they had to blow up a building to stop buildings from getting blown up. But it wasn't until the third watching that in the midst of exploding sounds, I caught the line of dialogue that says, it's a chain reaction. We must blow up this building to stop the chain. But that doesn't make any sense. There's only one explosion with buildings coming down. There's no chain of reaction. Well, that's what they're telling us, though, Stuart, is there is one explosion. It starts a chain reaction. They need to cut that off at some point so they drive that car to wherever the last flying that's never visualized i want that to be clear we never see that that is stopped by that building exploding what we see is a car driving into a building and then firing a missile into it and we do not see how that stops the sinking of venice well no but we see that the other houses stop sinking into the water which is what's happening is the chain reaction is crumbling the support structure and so somehow by blowing up this building somehow. first. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, somehow. Exactly. Terrible. This is only my second time watching this movie. I remember this being the climax. So <laughs> to my chagrin, when I'm only halfway through this film, I got like another 50 minutes, an hour left. To me, it was the climax. It was after this scene. I'm like, Mars. 
<laughs> this is, I, I mean, I get you can do ridiculous things. I'll accept that there's this, you know, luxurious car here and all of this stuff, but it has to make sense of what they're doing. And this now, I mean, we're stranded. We get to see the team kind of come together. We get of. to see them do various things. Quartermain and Sawyer shoot people. Mina turns into a vampire and eats people. Oh, God. Yeah, no, she doesn't turn into a vampire. She turns into a flurry of bats. No, I, I think she summoned the bats. No, no, at what point you see a human in there, it's really bad effects. She is like a ghost or something in those flurry of bats. But where do the bats come from? Belfries. Are you telling me that Venice is... Filled with bats that will just fly to her? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Venice in the late 19th century was filled with flying vermin. Yes. Are, are you speaking factually or are you just giving it to the film? I'm just giving it to the film. It was in the Da Vinci drawings. I saw them too. Anyway, <laughs> so yeah, th this is a horrible effect, by the way. Oh, awful. And the bats look bad. Mina looks bad in the bats. Mm. The movie mm -mm. looks bad. Mm -mm. And we're like halfway through this movie and all of a sudden, all this has become is a shouting, sweaty, explosive mess. Yeah, it's just about blowing things up. Again, I ask, why would you bring all of these literary characters or even superheroes just to blow up things? Have you seen the Avengers and Avengers Age of Ultron? No, no. The Avengers had great moments of interpersonal tension and dynamics. It's about the characters. This has nothing to do with these characters. These characters have nothing in common with one another. They don't interact. It's a huge mess. And do they ever even like each other? That like That's the thing. Do they ever finally come together where you like the Avengers they all fight each other the first half of that film because Loki's messing with them but then they become friends here I don't know if they ever like each other besides maybe Tom Sawyer and Quartermain they agree that they all hate Dorian Gray and I do too and that's what brings them together and unifies them is that they at least have the solitary purpose of wanting to kill their spy in their midst, which, again, this was a weird strand. In the journey, they believed that the Invisible Man was stealing Potion and taking the pictures, and the Invisible Man decides not to speak up for himself, but allow this mischaracterization to be... No, he stows away on a little mini Nautilus that Dorian Gray... And this, this is, like, one of the worst scenes... Dorian Gray steals this little sub from the Nautilus. He, like, opens the front hatch so he can see it's Dorian in there and, like, drives it towards the characters and then does his maniacal laugh and turns around and drives away. I'm like, oh, that is an awful cliche and you just did it. Yeah, and you guys have it right. What makes this not a good Super Team movie? What, God help me, the Justice League movie we reviewed two weeks ago had that this doesn't is some iota of chemistry among some of the characters. And that had bad chemistry, but there was at least a couple characters that clicked. Yeah. Here, this is like they're not even really sharing the same screen. It's like all of them filmed separately and they composited everything together. But I have a firm belief that what we are seeing is not the fault of any of the people involved, Stephen Norrington, Sean Connery, James Dale Robinson, I'm going to give you all a pass and point my finger directly at 20th Century Fox. This film is the epitome of studio meddling. Every story I read had that there were studio execs over Norrington's shoulder the entire time. They hired him because he was a success with Blade, and then they didn't trust him to do a dang thing here. He had a contract for a PG-13 film. They wouldn't even send it to the MPA. They just told him, don't even film that. That might be R. And they had the stunts written before the script, which is more and more common. See every Michael Bay film. Yeah. They started filming before the final act was written, yeah, this was the stories I heard about the later Die Hard movies, too. Yeah, and, and that never works well. And then Norrington was starting to bend under the pressure, and Connery was being non-compliant, and the two of them got into apparently really, really bad fights on set, and so Connery was trying to undermine Norrington. Everybody walked away from this looking bad, and the director and the star never worked again. And I'm, I'm going to blame Fox for just 
rushing the film that took an extra year to write. They wanted something out that summer. They wanted it to be explosive and have the widest appeal. So they're like, damn it, you're going to have an American. Damn it, you're going to have an explosion every 10 minutes. And damn it, we're going to do this, that, the other. And you're going to make sure this is the softest PG-13 ever. There's never a good film that goes that way. Well, here's what I would say to that. I think any studio looking at this property 